So what we're uh, hoping to do this, this morning is give you a chance to see the postdoc side of the, the story. Uh, we have a couple of things that will be, I think, particularly interesting. One is we did two of the patients with the trimoxy injection and two without. And I think you'll be impressed with the difference. I mean, part of our hope is to really uh, encourage the use of this uh, intravitreal injection as a really a new standard of care for, especially for these environments where it's very difficult for people to get and to consistently use drops. So when I go to Cameroon, we're going to exclusively be using. I mean, we'll be doing about 2,000 patients or more with trimoxy, and that, and you'll see the reason here in just a minute. Uh, so uh, the uh, second thing to see is just some patterns that go along with advanced pathology. Um, today what you, is uh, our first patient. Uh, his uh, post-op vision is, uh, so he was count fingers before, he's 2140 now. But if you look at that eye, you wouldn't see, think that the, the appearance of the anterior segment is not consistent with that vision. Turns out he's also diabetic. Uh, and so we've started him on some uh, Nevinac and so on. We're going to, in follow-up, will be to, to evaluate for diabetic uh, problems associated with this. One of the problems we have in evaluating these patients, you can't see the posterior segment. On almost, you know, M6, by definition, you're doing these advanced cataracts. So it's, a, it's always a bit of an uncertainty what's going to be the result, you know, what, what's going to be the outcome. Sometimes it's pretty clear when you do the case that this is, you know, that it won't be a good outcome, a white reflex or, you know, instead of a nice red reflex or whatever. Uh, but other cases, you really hope there was going to be even much better than sometimes you achieve. There'll be a couple examples of that today also. Um, uh, there are little subtle things that, you know, I've done this long enough and enough of these cases to where I have my suspicions. Um, you know, but uh, it, it turns out that I, I was unfortunately right about a couple of them today. So you'll see those, in it, but it'll be a good example of some of the challenges with doing advanced pathology, and no matter what procedure you use. Um, the good news is that in all the cases, the anterior segment looks really good, um, but not all the cases got all the vision acuity outcomes that we were hoping for, but it, we think there are some explanations for that. So our, our plan is, I've got a portable slit lamp over here. Uh, the plan is we'll get all the patients in here, um, if we, yeah, so we could out bring them all in. They'll each have a chart in their hand that gives, uh, uh, unfortunately, I just realized when I looked at this that the likelihood of you being able to read my notes is pretty low. Uh, so uh, if uh, there's any questions about that, uh, you know, please just let me know. Uh, sorry about that. I just realized what my wife has said all along, that that just stinks. My uh, handwriting is not so great. So uh, anyway, uh, so we'll uh, give you each a chance to, to see all the patients. Thank you. And we're very grateful that our patients were willing to uh, come and have all these doctors uh, check their eyes. So um, um, uh, this patient is the one. Uh, he needs to go pretty quick. Uh, so he, this We'll just leave uh, this this slit lamp here, and the, uh, and he'll he'll when he needs to go, then we'll move another patient over here. But meantime, you can be looking at these patients with the portable, portable slit lamp, and Dr. Hauser and I will be here to to answer questions. Uh, also interesting is the training syndrome, which is the students' outcomes were far better than my outcomes, and that has to do with a couple of things, in my opinion. <laughs> one is one is that the trainer always gets the worst cases, and uh, of course that was the case yesterday. So. Um, you know, uh, anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, but you did tell me. You Glenn did tell me yesterday, he goes, I think you're going to have some corneal edema on, on that one. And we didn't. It looks yes, good. It looks good. It looks good. Yeah, it looks good. good. Um, OK, so, so if you would uh, come on up, so, because uh, go, he, needs to, he needs to get going. That's right. She did uh, really great. Really great job. Thank you again, you all, for uh, being part of this and letting us. And then, uh, this, is, uh, okay, this is the small. Let me get this out of the way here. Thank <laughs> you. 
give a quick tutorial on how to use the portable slit lamp. I just it just dawned on me. I mean, this is really I don't even use a desktop slit lamp anymore. Been a long time since I've done that, so I'm quite comfortable with it. But many of you are not. So let me just give you a quick tutorial on how to use it uh, to get you started on that. So, um, so let's see. How can we do that? Um, I need a guinea pig. Okay. So, so if you'd uh, look right here for just a second, <laughs> thank you. So the everything will be set. So it's a 0.2 millimeter slit beam on this. This is a Kawa uh, portable slit lamp. Pediatricians love it. Pediatric ophthalmologists love it. And that's where I first got turned on to it. 10x magnification can be flipped up to 16x if you want to adjust the PD uh, by just ma manipulating it here. But be careful. This is my personal slit lamp. I don't want the gears stripped on the slit lamp. So you know if it feels stiff, it's a little stiff. It's supposed to be. Uh, adjust the PD. And if you want to, you can adjust the... Uh, uh, the uh, oculars as well if you need to. The trick to it is the thumb, I think. It's the ma easiest way to use it. You put your fingers on the forehead and then you use your thumb to focus. So it's really actually quite simple and then the trigger turns on the light. So, you know, you wait from the eye and just use your thumb. It stabilizes the slit lamp and you can use it to focus. So very, very easy to do and if you need to hold the eyelid, you can use one of your fingers to hold the eyelid while you're using your thumb to, to focus. So there you go, that's my little fix. You can change it, but I wouldn't bother with that. Uh, you know, you can change the length of the beam and the width of the beam and all that. Yeah, so that's right. Okay, so, so, so here you go. So you can take this and go look at Jorge? Yep, there you go. So he did the first and the third, and I did the second and the fourth. Go ahead and get started here again. Take uh, care for everyone's time. Um, just wanted to, to bring up a couple of important, and uh, Dr. Hauser, if you come up here also. So just in a, a brief discussion about the post-operative care uh, and some of the issues that uh, I hope these patients pointed out. There were several things, from my point of view, that were very important. Um, uh, one is that, that uh, Dr. Hauser, who's not done a lot of M6, had every bit of good, as good a result as I did. Uh, so there are some things that if you do them right, even if you don't do them fast, it works. Or perfect. Uh, uh, and so my, my point is that it's, it's, uh, it's somewhat forgiving. You know, there are certain things, you know this is true in surgery. Uh, you can do things, some things you, you sort of get away with and other things you don't. <laughs> and so the challenge to, when you're a trainer is to not pay attention to everything that you could say, you know, well, if you did this and this and this and this, then it's just overwhelming. So there was, uh, in my mind, there was a couple of things. So we, between the first case she did and the, in the last case she did, we had a brief discussion about a couple of things. And I, I think there was a change, she changed some things that she did that I think helped her be more efficient. So you notice the second case went a lot faster than the first case. Uh, they both had great visual outcomes though. A one day outcome. So uh, I think that's one important point. Second important point, I hope you noticed the difference in the uh, post-operative inflammation between the patients who received trimoxy and those who did not. Uh, I'm every bit convinced that this is really a standard of care for a developing nation, even for those that are, um, you know, limited access to care, whatever nation, you know, developing or not. Uh, you know, these patients are not going to be able to manage their drops well. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Deakins has seen this over and over again here. She is, uh, by the way, I introduced her yesterday, but she is the one who uh, works with her uh, clinic, the Community Eye Clinic, as a branch of the University of Houston Optometric Program, trains residents. I mentioned that yesterday, but her work has been instrumental in making this whole thing work uh, because we co-manage with them. 
Uh, they take care of all the post-operative care. They do all the preoperative evaluations and workups. Uh, and so it's a great partnership, and I'm so grateful for that. And by the way, not to make your head too big here, but Dr. Hauscher, even she, she's really good. Yeah. Dr. Hauscher <laughs> kept saying, he kept saying over and over again, yes, I know she's really good. Okay, she's really good. Yes, we're, she's really good. We are blessed. <laughs> we're the so, ones that are lucky. So, thank so you. but just the, the way they manage the patients and very unique that an optometric program has any clue even what M6 is, let alone can co-manage with, with me for this. So we've had a great partnership over the years when this was set up. And a part of my hope is that going forward in some of these countries, uh, it's not enough to just have op, uh, uh, ophthalmologists. There really needs to be a, an eye care infrastructure, which every bit is as important to have optometric care as ophthalmologic care. So I've, I've done some work on that, as a matter of fact. So just this is a great example. So, so the first point, um, big difference in number of cases. I've done about 13,000. You've done 50, how many? 50. 50 cases. OK, so big difference in number, number of cases. I had some warning signs when I was seeing these patients that this may not look good tomorrow. Uh, the, the first case who was diabetic, uh, the, that I did, and the second case that I did, who was pseudoexfoliation, who had a slightly hazy cornea. Before we did the operation, the reason I did the case uh, was for those reasons in the small pupil that didn't dilate. So some warning signs that it end, a big asymmetry in the vision, a hand motion in one eye, 20, 30 in the other. Those are all sort of prognostic warning signs that something, that all is not well in posterior segment land or wherever, you know, that there are other issues. Um, other, uh, so those are two big takeaways for me. Just give you each a chance to, to point out some things if you would. Uh, yeah, you. no, I, uh, I found uh, the instruction, the, the tidbits you gave me were very helpful. Uh, again, proceeding from first case to third case. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm getting more comfortable um, with it. And I have to certainly accept that I'm not flawless. In, in what I do, I mean, you're not. That that's part of what you're talking about, and you like to be, yeah, you know. But you're still learning, and and yet you just have to be really careful, and um, and uh, your hands need to do what you tell them to do, and and it all it all works. And um, I think the cornea situation for me is I like the clarity of these eyes. Uh, all the phaco surgeons in the room know the difference. And then the uveitis specialist in the room, you know, she's she's noticing the quietness of that that eye. And then the trimoxy, I think, does take the vision down uh, somewhat, just a little bit, maybe. Um, and so I, so I you're for- You're saying your patients really should have been 20, 20? Is that what you're saying? I probably, it could be, yeah. could be. But, but it, it does a little bit take them down. But I, I still like it. And what I do in Oklahoma is I don't do the intravitreal. I do intracameral, sometimes a little subconj as well. And we only use one vial per patient here in the U.S., whereas in overseas you can use um, internationally uh, two patients per vial. And so it's, it's a little different. Uh, I, w I would say that to you as well. So. Yeah, I would just reiterate um, that we have seen some nice outcomes, even in our FACO patients with the trimoxy, and I'm excited. We had a case early on with Dr. Strauss, a homeless patient who just would get his pack stolen overnight, and so we'd give him a new set of drops and give him a new set of drops, and, get, and he just couldn't stay on the drops, and so we had inflammation that we couldn't control. So that will be valuable moving forward. Um, as an OD managing these, I think it was very enlightening. The first time Glenn said he was going to do this, I went home and looked up M and the number six, and all the British intelligence agency information came up. I was trying to educate myself, and that's what happened. Um, Today, you know, I think what happened is we give Dr. Strauss a lot of complex cases. We try to pre-screen very well. Um, however, it doesn't always work perfectly. Our pre-screening involves understanding the health of the patient. We do a B scan to see if there's gross intact structures in the back, which I think overseas we wouldn't always have a B scan with you. And we use pupillary response, and we really try to make a good call. Uh, there have been a handful of cases that didn't regain vision, but we were, we're hopeful, I think, in this case, and we'll manage um, the cornea of um, Miss Esther, who was our Hispanic patient, or lady, female patient. Um, as an OD, you're always a little excited about blood in the anterior chamber. We had it just a little bit in Mr. Jorge, I think, but this is, we don't even see the pressure elevate when they have a hyphema, amazingly. And the quietness of the chamber is much appreciated postoperatively, but I can't think of any other, I mean, 
We're getting th- I get thick skin now when we watch these. Um, all the incisions today looked really well healed. Um, we deal with more low pressure than we do high pressure postoperatively, and I've learned that the pressure patch is uh, a lifesaver there. So the patient doesn't want that, though, because they want that patch off, and they don't want me to put it back on that next day. So I'm the bad guy putting that back on. Yeah. I was just going to add one more thing. So on my second case, the, the, the patient who had the subtenons who was looking everywhere, and you heard me saying, Jorge, can you look down? Jorge, you remember that? Um, so I was talking to uh, Diego, and he, said, he was saying, you know, Gene, if you'd have taken your left hand and just kind of hung onto that eye yourself, you know, he's right. I probably should have done that because my left hand is pretty good, and I didn't think of that. Uh, so I would just offer that to you as a, another thing that you could do to, to deal with a moving eye. But, you know, as FACO surgeons, we're kind of used to going with yeah. them whenever they move around. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. That's, that's great. Uh, just a few comments just to put together a few thoughts about postoperative care. If you could give me the, um, the cue on the screens here again uh, for the PowerPoint. Uh, no matter what, you know, no matter how you, how you deal with cataracts, the, the point is restoring vision. And, and seeing these patients at day one, I hope, gives you that impression that this is a very powerful tool for prompt restoration of vision. So I always challenge places where I go to do training for for this procedure is and why do you treat this as if that is no not relevant why is one day vision not important to you so they'll do they'll wave their hands like oh well we don't really measure one day visions you know and or yeah we just kind of wave our hand and if they can see it that's good enough that's about as good as they get with measuring the one day visions i said my challenge to you is that your one day vision should be every bit as good as you would want for your phaco patients and that's a high bar uh, but I think it's a realistic one. It's an important one to have, and it gets you the right mindset in how you look at these patients. Uh, so I have an audit uh, sort of system that I think is important. I mentioned yesterday the one most important thing I think I would say to take away is know what you've done. <laughs> Not how many, but know what your outcomes are and, and have some way of evaluating that. Now, sorry, this is small and a little busy, uh, but it's just an example of what I use uh, that's kind of a standard. And now you can do that in a lot of different ways. This is just what I've done. Uh, but have something that you use. And I use this for my post-operative team when I work in places that, you know, and I'm, I'm, they're asking, well, how do we manage this post-operatively? Because I'm trying to build a team also, not just do cataract surgery. So I need to give them an idea of what to do. Just like Diego has his team, they know exactly what to do with his post-op patients. They have this in their head, right? Well, I've worked a lot of places where they don't have anything in their head. Uh, and so it's a way to help them also. So just consider that. Some typical things to, to, to keep in mind, these patients, most of them you notice, one had a, a couple of them had mild pain, most of them had no pain. Uh, just some paracetamol is usually all that, that's needed. And typically there is marked improvement. So every one of these patients went from uh, 2400 is the best visual acuity preoperatively, uh, and you know LP hand motion were all the types of visions that these patients had. So significant improvement in vision at day one is typical. Expect at least 624 or better. Uh, that should be sort of a, a standard that you have in your head. And I really, uh, you know, 618 even uh, is re- realistic. Uh, typically, no difference between the mature cataracts and those that are a little less advanced. It's not about that. Like in phaco surgery, I, asked, I just ask a couple people, you know, what would you expect to see if you tried to phaco that? You saw the cataracts yesterday. What if you tried to phaco that? What would you have expected today? That wouldn't be your 2020 one day post op patient. You wouldn't be expecting, you would have already told that patient, in fact, you're probably going to have several weeks before you have good vision because you know. It's going to take a lot of phaco power to get that visual acuity uh, uh, to, the, to, um, that's going to affect that cornea, and then you're going to have to treat that. Um, but it doesn't make any difference with M6. It's all the same. Um, if, there's a, if the vision is poor and you don't have an obvious uh, 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 explanation, then you should suspect that there's inflammation, maybe some posterior segment problems, and you might need to, as one of the patients we put on Nefinac, and the others we added, um, the two with, with the, the intravitreal trimoxy, no drops at all. Um, look for intraocular pressure elevations occasionally, but it's pretty rare. Uh, I would say maybe 10%. Uh, Diego, about the same. What, what do you say as far as intraocular pressure elevations postoperatively in your M6 cases? Uh, what, what percentage? Uh, at one day? How about at one day? Uh, most of the time, it's uh, maybe 5% of my cases. Okay, 5 
Yeah, so a little better than me, I'm about 10% of my cases will be a 30, something like that. In my, my setting is, it's like a, like a factory, and uh, we follow the same step yeah. most of the time with small variation, yeah. that's it, that's yeah, it, the issue. Yeah, makes a difference. Uh, don't forget to look for wound leaks. They are rare, but they do occur. And don't forget that pressure patch message that uh, Dr. Deacons mentioned to you. Uh, look for iris prolapse. Of course, that to me is one reason that you really do need to return to surgery. But short of that, pressure patching usually is all that you need. Um, I've also found that, that surgeons have sort of characteristic patterns that it can kind of almost like si signature look to the eye. In fact, you probably, if you with your FACO cases, your techs know, oh, that's a so-and-so doctor case. You know, they look at that, but they know there's certain characteristic things because it's of how you do things. It's actually the same with M6. And in time, you start to see these patterns for yourself and others can see them too. So look for those patterns because they tell you about things. They, they are, it's a learning tool. And uh, make sure that you keep the bar high just like you do for FACO surgery. Uh, in fact, I found it to be one of the biggest uh, barriers to progress is that they don't expect M6 surgery to have a good result necessarily. They're not looking for great one-day results, and they should be. So patterns of edema, if you see generalized stromal edema, you should expect that that, pro that case probably took a long time to do. There may have been a lot of flow. Uh, there may have been vitreous loss or large nucleus. Uh, there may have been some excessive pressure with the nucleus on the cornea, or you may have had things like the wrong fluids. Um, somebody didn't mix the normal saline. So I have to think about all that where I, in a lot of places where I work. If I go into a local hospital, uh, let's say I'm working in, a, so I'll be working in Cameroon next week. So I'll go into the, I'll work on the ship most of the time, but I'll also be a guest uh, to evaluate local hospitals and how they're doing things. And so I've learned over time to look for errors like this that are so simple to fix. Uh, and sometimes it shows up in the post-operative um, appearance. If the endema is at the tunnel, expect that there was something about how the keratome is being used. It may be a dull keratome, may not have been used correctly. Lens loop may not have been used correctly. If it's in the inferior cornea, it's almost always an error with the lens loop. Because what happens is they put the lens loop in and they push the nucleus down. Instead of sliding underneath it, they push it into the inferior cornea. So it was in the tunnel, now it's not in the tunnel. Now it's down in the inferior angle, shoved up against the cornea, and they use that as the wedge to, to push the lens loop under, that will invariably result in corneal edema in the inferior part of the cornea. Very characteristic appearance. I can tell you what happened even if I don't see it at the time of surgery. If it's in the center, most common central edema is most likely Simcoe errors because uh, what happens is while you're removing the cortex, you're lifting that tip, and a lot of times the chamber shallows uh, unexpectedly, uh, and the reaction then results in uh, contact with the cornea and so on. Uh, so you, you have problems that, that show up that way. Some uh, just typical appearances, you've seen this now, so I'll go through this very quickly for the sake of time. Dr. Mejia can finish uh, with his talk. Use, use one tip, use the unoperated eye as a, as a, as a clue, uh, you know, to compare uh, if you're unsure about what you're seeing, especially in your early experience with this. And, you, you know, is that M6 related or not M6? Use the opposite eye, use the fellow eye. That can give you some clues. You should expect a nice, clear cornea. Expect the wound generally to be covered. Um, this is a six-week result uh, that you can see here, nice and clear, and virtually disappeared. This is not normal, uh, but the problem is this is what many surgeons accept as normal, and uh, that's sort of my constant battle and frustration. Again, this generalized stroma edema on the left, the surgeon uh, that did that was a visiting surgeon. And um, I held up the eyelid, that's my thumb there, and took this picture and said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, great result. And I looked at him and I went, well, let me show you these next five patients. And they all had perfectly cure corneas. I said, that's a great result. And let me challenge you, this is our goal. Uh, so he just had completely the wrong perspective about what a great result is. Uh, and he had learned to accept that. But my point is he had learned to accept that. He can unlearn that too. Focal stromal edema up above, as I mentioned. Focal stromal edema down below from pushing on the nucleus. Uh, microcystic edema from high pressures. Uh, residual cortex, a couple of examples of that. Uh, some epinuclear chips, those generally need to be washed out if you see something like that. And of course, if you have a dislocated, there's the haptic of the IOL out on the left side there that uh, needs to be repositioned. 
Uh, peaked pupils sometimes need to be fixed, sometimes not, I would say. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of different arguments to be made about what to do about that. In general, if there's no iris prolapse, I don't do anything about it. I just leave it. Um, and then end off the minus is the most tragic thing. We've all, unfortunately, very aware of that problem. But the data shows that there is no higher incidence of endophthalmitis. I think that I think Steve presented that yesterday. The incidence of endophthalmitis with uh, M6 is no higher than it is with phaco emulsification, even though there's a larger wound. So that's good news. Old, you know, poor prognosis cases. Be watching for that. Uh, I think we've made the, the message should be pretty clear. We you know really would encourage you to find someone that you can work with, and uh, you know it's. There are very many willing people here, <laughs> represented here, so myself included. So I hope you will take advantage of, you know, the the opportunities that have been presented here to to work with someone. I'd also encourage you to really be purposeful uh, in your efforts, whatever direction you go. Really think I said yesterday, maybe uh, you know, prayer is a good thing. You know, to follow up from this, just to um, to think through what does this mean now for you. I hope this was a uh, uh, you know, something of a, a pivotal or a, a pivotal event to, to be here. You know, it's, um, you know, sometimes things come into your life that you, you don't know how they'll affect you. And then all of a sudden you realize, man, that was pretty significant what just happened there. So I, I hope that will be, for some of you at least, that that's what this will be. And I think prayer is a great way to follow, up, follow that up. And share, um, be open, be ready to share what happens. Uh, share your frustrations. You know, can't find a place to, to get training or had training and it turned out to not be what I hoped it would be or whatever it is or had a great experience with whatever. You know, just I think the more there's communication, Stan is just so so good with this. He's given us all these tools to communicate with. Um, you know, let's take advantage of these tools that we have to, to facilitate communication and networking uh, amongst those who have these interests. Um, Help the trainees become lifelong students. As you as you get into the training environments, remember that we we several people have said it. You know, we're all still learning. Part of being a trainer is not to help your trainee arrive, but to help them find a path that that they can stay on for the rest of their career, that keeps them growing, that keeps them learning, that keeps them studying their results and knowing what they're doing. Uh, help them become passionate about quality. I mentioned audit as a, as a good tool for that, uh, that you incorporate that into your training, that, you know, that it's not enough that they got the cataract out. You really do care about what the result was. That really does matter. Uh, and help them understand that. And help them become effective, not just in surgery. Maybe some of them will need a little help with life, too. <laughs> you know, some of the people that you might find yourself training might have a some challenges, real challenges to deal with that you maybe can provide just a little bit of, of help and encouragement to, you know, some of you may be sort of business oriented, but probably most of you are not. But even though uh, I'm not a businessman by any stretch, I have found that there are certain principles about how you do business with people that really seem to matter. And so I try to pass those on too. Is there struggling with, well, I can't get my clinic to work or, you know, you know whatever the, the problems might be. Uh, and, you know, make this, a, help them to see that as, this is part of something that's not just their personal growth, but that there's a, um, you know, a, 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 a business that's going to develop from this, uh, that could develop from this, and that needs to be tended to and shepherded just like their surgical skills do. Uh, we're so grateful that you all were here. Uh, I'm sure Stan has some final remarks also, but I just wanted to, to give you my personal thanks for coming and sharing this time with us. And even though it was a very long and intense day yesterday that everyone hung in there, and I, I hope the coming back today gave you some additional insight. I really am a strong believer in the post-operative look at things to really help cement some things in your head and help you to, to better understand even what the potential for this procedure is. So. Uh, thank you very much.